Hi everyone, it's James here. Welcome to another video. So today I'm going to be looking at one of my favourite bands of all time. I uh, can't quite believe that uh, it's taken me this long to get to them. Uh, but it's the great uh, Teenage Fan Club. And this is my very battered copy. See a big crack there in the CD. Um, of their, um, officially their third album, actually, Bandwagon-esque. Uh, which came out in uh, 1991 on Creation Records. And um, this was a big album for me, my third year at university. So this would have been in 92, I think I picked it up. It was just at a period when I was starting to finally clue into uh, contemporary music. I'd spent most of my time at uni listening to The Beatles, The Police, and um, Pink Floyd, and Genesis, and just stuff from back in the day. And, uh, you know, the whole Manchester thing totally passed me by, really, even though I was kind of aware of the music, I was kind of hearing it all the time, but it didn't really occur to me to, to buy it or pick it up. But I was increasingly starting to read the music papers, you know, reading The Enemy, reading The Melody Maker, and kind of starting to take an interest, finally, properly, in what was going on. And I bought this record from the bookshop uh, on campus here at Lancaster University, round about the time that I picked up another couple of records that were kind of newly emerging artists. There was uh, Blur uh, with their album Leisure, there was um, Screamer Delica by Primal Scream, um, there was uh, Woodface by Crowded House and I mean I enjoyed all those albums to an extent but none of them really knocked me out. This was the the only one really of that little group of um, CDs that I picked up which genuinely knocked me out. I loved it. I loved it from the start. I still love it to this day. To me it's a 10 10 star album, you know, 10 out of 10. It is magnificent. Teenage Fan Club turned into one of the very, very few groups over the years whose music I bought on a regular basis, as in when each release came out, I picked it up, with the exception of one that I'll talk about in a minute. Very few artists in my life I've done that with. It's turned into a bit of a habit with me, I guess. You know, these bands where you just automatically, you see that there's a new record coming out and you pick it up and they never disappoint. They've got kind of highs and lows in their catalogue. Well, not lows, but they've got their kind of high points and slightly less high points. But I, I love all their records. They never disappoint me, really. So I thought it would be good fun today to show you the collection. It's not a complete collection. I'll show you the collection. If you're not aware of Teenage Fan Club, um, I might try and do a little playlist for you down below so you can check that out. And... Uh, that should be good fun. So it's quite funny, for years and years I thought this was the debut album by Teenage Fan Club, but it's not. It's actually their third album. And I've never actually owned the first album. Uh, I've heard it online and some people swear to this day that it is the greatest of the lot, you know. Uh, it's not quite up my street. When they started they were a much more kind of shambolic and noisy and chaotic kind of group. They're from Glasgow originally and they came out of what's known as the C86 kind of scene. You know, back in the 80s, there was this thing, um, it all started kind of, that kind of John Peel culture, really, this generation of um, slightly shambolic, noisy indie bands who were kind of, you know, sort of making a name for themselves on, on shows like John Peel uh, and in the pages of The Enemy. But they were fairly uh, unambitious groups, I guess. You know, they weren't particularly um, commercial. Anyway, so Teenage Fan Club formed uh, in 89 in Bells Hill in Glasgow and they consisted of Norman Blake uh, on guitar vocals, Raymond McGinley uh, on guitar vocals, Gerard Love on guitar vocals and Francis MacDonald on drums. They recorded the album A Catholic Education which came out on the indie label Paper House in 1990. Like I said, it was a fairly shambolic record, um, didn't particularly do much for them. Now, quite soon after that, they actually signed to Creation Records. Now, Creation, obviously, were going to be the home to a lot of very big bands in the 90s, not least of which were Oasis. And I'm sure I read somewhere that Nell Gallagher basically copped the Oasis guitar sound from Teenage Fan Club, because from quite early on, they had this very powerful, noisy kind of guitar sound, uh, quite scuzzy, sort of deep pile guitars, noisy, and... Of course, that turned into one of the defining characteristics of Oasis's sound. But what Teenage Fan Club also had, uh, as the story starts to um, starts to develop, is this amazing sense of pop melody and an amazing ability to deliver pop hooks, which for me makes them rival Oasis, really, overall. Now, there was another album called The King, which came out extremely briefly in 1991 on the US label Matador. I think it was stitched together behind the band's back almost, you know, out of kind of outtakes and studio cuts that they weren't particularly happy with. It was withdrawn on the day of its release and this became 
um, the next album, which was actually uh, on Creation Records, came out in 1992, got to number 22 in the charts. It was actually quite a big album. Most of their records, actually, the chart placings are much more impressive than I have kind of thought. I always thought that Teenage Fan Club were basically a kind of cult band, but they've had quite a lot of cult success. Now, by this time, they had a new drummer. Francis MacDonald, the original drummer, uh, left to go to university, but he will uh, rejoin the story later. And um, on this album, they had the drummer Brendan O'Hare. And if you've not heard this album, you must check it out. It is fantastic. Right, just right from the top, the concept uh, is this instrumental track. It's brilliant. Satan is this really fast kind of punk type song. It's not punk, really. It's far too melodic for that. And then it goes into this great track list, you know, December, What You Do To Me, which has just got an amazing pop hook to it. I don't know, Star Sign, which is a fantastic song, all these shimmering guitars, you know, just sort of almost psychedelic really, but just with this kind of heavy undercurrent. When I say heavy, don't think, oh, this is a kind of heavy band, like a kind of Black Sabbath. It's not heavy like that. It's very sunshiny, it's very melodic. Um, and the one thing I, I suppose I haven't mentioned yet is just the vocal harmony sound. Very, very rich, three-part harmonies all the way through. I kind of describe their vocal sound as being a kind of dark brown vocal sound. It's very rich, it's very um, textured. I mean, the band that they were compared to early on, well, there were two bands that they were compared to early on. One was The Birds, uh, just because of the kind of West Coast harmony sound. And the other was uh, the cult American band Big Star, with whom they share a lot of melodic and harmonic territory, I guess. Very similar, kind of happy, sad, lovelorn melancholy songs, beautiful chiming guitars, thick massed vocal harmonies. It's a tremendous album, love it, always have done, and it's just an absolute classic of indie pop, British indie pop, but to define it in that way narrows it down too much really. So then in 1993 they followed that album up with the album 13, uh, and this also featured Brendan O'Hare on drums. And this record was more, it sounded more like Oasis, it was heavier again, they'd gone back to a slightly kind of heavier and more chaotic sound again. Um, but it still had some great tracks on it, it had the song Fear of Flying, which is really great, uh, Gene Clark at the end, uh, Tip of the Hat to the Birds. Um, but generally speaking, it was less of a commercial record uh, than Van Wagon-esque. It definitely had a kind of harder edge to it. Some of the songs are kind of slower, a bit sludgier. Um, I found it more difficult to get into this one. I didn't, I didn't really like it as much as Ben Wagon-esque. It didn't seem to have quite the same effervescent quality to it, but it's still a good album. Uh, and that one got to number 14 in the charts in um, 1993. Now after this record, the drummer Brendan O'Hare actually left the band and he was the most energetic drummer of all the drummers they ever had. And I think my kind of understanding of their sound or their history is that Brendan O'Hare really drove those early albums. He, he had a very thrashy, fast kind of explosive drum uh, style over which the band, you know, laid these these tracks, which had a kind of, I don't want to say punky energy, because, you know, I don't want to put people off who are not into punk rock. Not punk, but energetic kind of style. You know, they shared some characteristics of shoegaze, I guess, that kind of almost white out style of guitar. Um, but it was far more energetic than that, you know, they were not staring at their shoes. And Brendan O'Hare's drumming uh, was a large part of that. Now, when he left uh, after 13, they got in a guy called Paul Quinn, and he stayed with them for three albums. And Paul Quinn's um, drumming style was much calmer. It was much more uh, straight-ahead melodic, kind of pop-rock kind of drumming, just um, not quite as explosive, not quite as hyperactive. And they started to really now just work the melodic angle. And this record, which is called Grand Prix, which came out in 1995, uh, got to number seven in the charts. It was quite a big hit. A fantastic album. Really great. Uh, it contains the song Sparky's Dream, which is possibly the finest um, teeny song. Now, Sparky's Dream is written by Gerald Love. And what I've not mentioned yet in this video is that um, Teenage Fan Club were a little bit like Queen in that they had individual songwriters, each of which wrote songs. And they all have similar but distinct... Uh, styles of songwriting. So I'd say Norman Blake is probably the more poppy. He's got the most commercial sound of the three of them, I think. His songs are very hooky. Raymond McGinley, his songs are the most droney 
They're good, but they're slightly droney. They've got a more droney quality, and his voice is dry and laconic. You can instantly tell a Raymond song. It's got its own kind of slightly crabbed, introspective feel. And then you've got Gerard Love, whose songs are just wonderful, kind of chiming, beautiful. If you think of the most beautiful, kind of sweet birds song you've ever heard in your life, always so, so melodic, so sweet, but very ethereal. His songs are the most... Simon and Garfunkel-esque, if you imagine that kind of sound, you know, just fantastic. Sparky's Dream is just a brilliant song. On this album as well, you've got what, just one of the most brilliantly named songs ever by Raymond McGinley, which is Verisimilitude. And he works that into the song, you know, into the chorus of the song brilliantly. I mean, what a fantastic word to try and get into a song. Anyway, a brilliant album. Then a couple of years later, in 97, they released their highest charting album. This one got to number three in the charts. I had no idea that it would have been such a big album. Songs from Northern Britain, uh, from 1997. This album and the next one, I think you can kind of pair them together. They're much more... They're, they're kind of moving more decisively away, maybe, from that indie rock sound. They're starting to explore different textures now. Different instruments start to pop up on their records. You know, you get vibraphones, you get a kind of harpsichord. It's all getting a bit more, uh, I guess, Beach Boys and Beatles. And again, this album is brilliant. Uh, so, so many good tracks on it. Start Again, the opening track, is fantastic. Ain't That Enough is a great song. I Don't Want Control of You. Beautiful hooks, beautiful singing. Great, great lyrics, just a wonderful sound all the way through. A fantastic album. That was the last album that, that they released on Creation, because Creation went down the tubes, I think, right about that time. And they signed to Columbia, and in 2002 they put out the album Howdy. This was not as big a hit, it got to number 33 in the charts. Again, this one has got Paul Quinn on um, drums, and again, it's a fine album. I wouldn't say it's quite up there with songs from Northern Britain, uh, but it's still got some great material on it. The song Happiness is fantastic. Um, Dum 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 is great. The Town in the City which has a wonderful kind of chiming, melodic, sugar rush kind of sound to it. It's hard to describe their music sometimes, but if you just think melody, melody, harmony, uh, hooks, um, that kind of characterises them pretty well. So that was Howdy. That one came out, like I said, uh, in the year 2000. And then there was a change again. They changed drummer and they changed back to Francis McDonald, who'd been the original drummer. And um, they released an album um, called Words of Wisdom and Hope in 2002. I don't have that one. It was a collaboration with uh, a guy called Jad Fair, who was from the lo-fi American band um, Half Japanese. I don't know why that record passed me by. It just did. Um, I will go back and get it at some point. I'm not quite sure why I didn't pick it up, but I didn't. Uh, so the next album that I uh, have is the next one that they made. And this is after they left Columbia and they formed their own label. And they released an album in 2005 uh, called Man Made. And this got to number 34 in the charts. By this point, they've totally lost all pretense at being a young band, shall we say, you know. So most of the noise has gone. And they've turned into a mellow band. So this next... This album and the next one, they're, they're easily the most mellow. Mellow, kind of laid back, there's a kind of West Coast vibe. The songs are still really good. It's All In My Mind, uh, which is the um, album opener, is a great, great song. You've Got Only With You is a fantastic song as well. But the sound, it's almost soporific in places. They're getting, it's almost like it's too laid back for its own good. And occasionally sounds a little bit desultory, I think. But it's not, it's not a bad album by any stretch of the imagination. Like I said, you know, I like all these records. Um, so that was Man Made uh, from 2005. Then there was a five year gap then before the next one. And this is kind of part two really, Shadows. Slightly better though, I'd say. Um, the energy levels um, have picked up a little bit. This one got to number 30 uh, in 2010. Again, it's got some wonderful tracks. The opening track, Sometimes I Don't Need to Believe in Anything. It's got a kind of glorious uh, pop shimmer to it. Um, when I Still Have V, which I think is a Norman Blake song, uh, is just a great kind of feel-good drinking song. Dark Clouds is a very delicate, beautiful ballad by, I think it's a, I think it's a Raymond song, that one. A nice album, like I said. Again, it's, it's done in that kind of late teenage fan club style, which is far more laid back, almost soporific in places. Some just some really nice songwriting and some nice textures. You know, they're still using keyboards and vibes and occasional harpsichords in these records, so it's definitely moved away from that creation vibe. And then this is the uh, not the latest album because they've actually got an album coming out uh, in a few weeks' time, which obviously I don't have yet. 
Um, this one came out in 2016 and it's called Here. And this one got to number 10 in the charts. I had no idea it had been such a big hit. Um, this picks up the pace again. It doesn't go back to the early days of them being a kind of, um, you know, scuzzy, noisy rock band. But they're starting to pick up the tempos. There's a f some more electric guitars coming to the fore again. And once again, it's just got some great songs on it. Like all their albums, it's split evenly between the three songwriters. They're very... Um, democratic. In fact, on at least a couple of their albums, they're so democratic that they actually take it in turns on the album, you know, to each have a song. There's a slightly sad um, coda to this story in that uh, after this album was recorded, Gerard Love uh, announced that he was leaving the band. Now, the reason given, um, you know, on the official website and on Wikipedia was that he didn't want to tour anymore or he was, he was wanting to cut down on the touring and the others didn't kind of um, agree with that, shall we say. So, um, he left the group and it's such a shame you know to leave the band if, if that's the only reason i mean why on earth he couldn't just stay in the band and be the brian wilson of the group i don't know because gerard's songs are genuinely magical i think out of the three songwriters his songs are you know are my favorite ones norman blake has written some great songs don't get me wrong as is raymond mcginley all three of them are great writers but there's something about gerard love songs you know he wrote sparky's dream um, he wrote um, Star Sign on the first album. So the next album is coming out, like I said, in a few weeks' time, I think, now. It's quite, so it's quite imminent, um, but we're down to the two songwriters now. So um, it's a shame, but I guess, you know, bands can't, uh, can't stay together forever. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you haven't checked out Teenage Fan Club or you only know the first couple of albums, you know, do yourself a favour, have a good delve into their catalogue. If you like The Beatles, if you like The Birds, if you like Big Star, um, if you like melodic pop rock from the 1970s as well, you know, Beach Boys, anything like that. Anything with a great melody, with great hooks, with fantastic vocal harmonies and really great lyrics as well. Uh, you would definitely enjoy Teenage Fan Club. I know there's a great deal of affection for them out there um, in the music world. So that's it for now. Take care, folks. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.